Hey everybody, uh, I've been threatening for a while now to do a video talking about remotoring um, 1970s era West Side Brass. I have quite a bit of it. My experience for the most part has been that the models run really poorly, they run really fast. Um, the exception being some of the uh, C16s that were late in the West Side era. If you've got one of the C16s that's got full back head detail, don't touch it. They're unbelievable models, but um, they're kind of the exception and not the rule. The C25s on the test track behind you, we're going to do a little comparison and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, the K37 has a sort of similar drive system. It is pretty common uh, pretty much in common with the K36, the K28, and the K27s. They're, they're sort of similar under the hood, so we're going to look at that. So that said, uh, let's jump right in. Alright, so this is going to be a really quick comparison to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. The C25 on the left is brand new, untouched, out of the box. The one on the right I rebuilt the drive mechanism, uh, put in a low speed Namiki cordless motor with a flywheel. Um, so this is this is a quarter throttle on an old uh, Tech 2 MRC power pack. Just watch. So I think you get the point here. Um, if you were to run the, uh, well, let's go ahead and just slide it back. We're going to run the unmodified one now at full speed. Hold on your hats. Yeah, um, it literally does burnouts. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about how to fix that today. I guess just for quick comparison, uh, let's go ahead and run the modified locomotive at 12 volts and uh, you'll see that the top speed is actually pretty prototypical. Alright, so let's pull these two apart and compare and I'll show you what's going on under the hood. All right, so here's the story. We're gonna start on the left with the unmodified locomotive. This is the stock motor. Um, I don't know how many RPMs it is, but it's a lot and it has a very high starting voltage. Um, gonna point out a couple things. One, this is a brass worm. So that's, I got one sitting right here. Uh, this is actually out of a broken K27 kit Nakamura kit that I've got sitting on the shelf um, but same parts um, that brass worm is riding against a brass idler gear brass on brass is a bad idea uh, the brass idler gear then transmits to uh, a brass gear on the axle so you've got brass on brass on brass with a brass uh, shaft so this is altogether a recipe for things wearing out. You really don't want to have brass on brass, you know, same metal. Um, you need to put some steel or some plastic in there in order for things to survive. So this is the unmodified chassis. Um, if we come over here to the left, you'll notice that this one looks very different. So the first and most obvious thing is that this is a Namiki 1630 cordless motor. I got a whole stack of these from a surplus dealer um, for about 10 bucks a piece, which is a steal. These models, uh, these motors are, they're amazing. Uh, incredibly powerful, extremely low speed, um, low starting voltage, massive torque, very smooth. So the problem is if you look, um, these motors are 
very different lengths and then you've got a flywheel as well that adds additional length. So the first order of operations was to actually pull the whole chassis apart and then to move the gearbox forward to the second driver. Um, and in the process I had to actually do a little notching. I know the purists out there are just cringing but this was a rescue model so I didn't feel bad, right? That's my rule, rescue model. Um, <laughs> But, uh, so yeah, so I moved the gearbox ahead and that allowed me to squeeze the motor and the flywheel in. Um, that flywheel probably misses the back head by about a millimeter or two. It's, it's in there really tight, but it's the biggest flywheel I could get um, to fit. This was one of the, the prototype ones and I decided, hey, let's go for broke and see how much more we can squeeze in. Um, you'll also notice that it's mounted to the... Uh, the plastic rather than the metal end and that was just an accommodation to be able to tuck the wiring in there and um, get a, the longer shaft was on this end as well so that helped me to get the worm on there and get it oriented but I've got the parts laid out here so this is a Northwest Shortline replacement part it's a 305-6 gear uh, it's specifically for a whole bunch of these west side models. Um, spend money with Northwest Short Lines so that they stay around. They're a really important resource and if we didn't have them we would be screwed. <laughs> um, this is the brass idler that came out with the brass pin and this is the Northwest Short Line gear for comparison. What I ended up doing was because this gear doesn't have a hub it was kind of wobbly and unsupported so I actually I I don't have one here to show you but I bored this out and sleeved it with a brass sleeve so that it then was more like this profile here uh, which was well supported so that's that's kind of critical I had trouble with the gear trying to deflect and bind um, but that basically covers it for the major modifications. The other two big things that I did, uh, number one was I pulled the driver set out and actually had to true the gear on the axle. Um, it, it had a high spot, so it was, actually, it was actually hopping, if you can try to picture that, as it was going around and it was causing a locomotive to have a weird lurch and a hitch. Um, so I took the gear off. I actually lightly, lightly, lightly bored it uh, by maybe a thousandth of an inch or so just to clean it up and then took the axle apart or half of it apart and turned down the knurling so that there was just a tiny bit of knurling. It, it doesn't need much, but somebody went crazy with the knurling machine and that was the reason that the, uh, the gear was on there non-concentric. The second thing I did was to replace all the driver springs with super soft ones that I also got from Northwest Shortline. Um, they're, they're extremely soft and they help this thing uh, navigate over rough track and uneven spots. They, they actually flex. The springs that come in this thing might as well be rocks. They have no give whatsoever. So that's pretty much it for the major modifications under the hood. I did add a spring uh, on the kingpin for the lead truck, which helps keep it from flopping around. Uh, it also improves electrical pickup through that. And that's it for the modifications between those two. Like I said, it's super obvious that these are very different under the hood now. There's a whole heck of a lot more motor. Um, man, that thing's super magnetic. Um, and this in this rather large flywheel. All right, so now we're gonna talk about Mr. K37 here. I'm gonna run this at full speed and then I want you to notice what happens when I immediately shut off the power. That's right, 
it coasts to a stop. It's a very free running mechanism. Do a low speed pass here. I can actually get it to run a lot slower with DCC, but it's, you know, tough at, I think this is three volts of track power. Pretty smooth though. All right, so we've got everything torn apart and laid out for you. Um, and I managed to scrounge up some extra pieces so I could show you what all the content looks like that you're dealing with here. So first off, uh, this is actually the uh, soldered together brass gearbox. And I pulled this out of my spare K27 kit sitting on the shelf. Um, this is the bottom cover plate, this screws on. Brass worm gear, I'm sorry, brass worm, brass worm idler gear, uh, brass shaft, and then this is a driver assembly with the brass gear. And then of course this is the Delrin replacement from Northwest Shortline that would end up getting modified with a hub like this one for better support so it's not trying to twist. Uh, I did manage to dig up a five pole motor that was really close to the one that came out of this model. This is a KTM. This actually came out of my Westside Heisler. Um, pretty much the same garbage. These are terrible motors. This is the Namiki replacement that I used. It's a 1630. Um, and then the biggest, biggest flywheel that I could fit. So, and as you saw, when I powered this thing off instantly, it just coasted to a stop. The, uh, the flywheel does a really great job. So a little bit of magic here. This is a one and a half millimeter shaft. This is actually a three thirty seconds shaft. So what you have to do is make these magic adapter pieces. Um, I use dowel pins, precision ground dowel pins from McMaster Car, and then I micro bore these on my jeweler's lathe to be a light press fit onto these 1.5 millimeter shafts and then I fix them with a little tiny bit of Loctite which um, if you ever need to take these apart for some reason just a little bit of heat is usually enough to release those. So that's everything that's under the hood. I'm going to rotate this around just to give you a little bit better view of what's happening here. Uh, unlike the C25 I did not move the position of the gearbox to the uh, second driver. I just went ahead and left this where it was. There was plenty of room to work with. And I've actually used flanged slot car bearings. These are 3 seconds inside diameter slot car bearings, ball bearings, in place of the plain bearings that were in here, and I wish I actually had pulled them out to show at this point, but... This sleeve bearing would have originally gone on the end here um, to support it, and then the worm would have sat right here, so that's what would have been resting in the gearbox. This, the Namiki, 330 seconds adapter shaft made from a dowel pin. And then this just lays out the arrangement in the gearbox. So you would actually have these little slot car 330 seconds uh, ball bearings on either side of the worm. So these guys actually sandwich like this together inside the box. And I would usually shim um, to just a tiny little bit of backlash there to keep the worm from shifting. Um, and this is what a pair of those bearings actually looks like. Yeah, there's a, a front and a rear. Oops, sorry. Going blind. Yep, front and a rear. Um, and the way that this goes together is you put the motor and shaft together with the worm. The flanges for the two ball bearings actually sit on either side and then I use some really really thin shims uh, actually I think five thousandths thick or so and then bent them uh, flexed them in the middle like a Pringle chip so they're kind of a, a spring washer to take out any end play and 
that's basically it. The next bit of secret sauce here, and this is something I learned from Narrow Gauge Gazette years and years ago, uh, I actually use silicon to fix the motor in place on its carrier. And the way that you do that is you basically set this thing vertically once you've got the motor shaft and bearings and worm assembled so it takes all the load off, it keeps it neutral. Use some, uh, I, I use some GE silicone and um, let this thing sit overnight and once you're done you know the motors uh, position should be neutral it should have no load on it and again as you can see when I shut the power off and let this thing go it just coasts down the track which tells me that there's uh, no weird loads on the motor shaft that are causing any undue friction so that's about it but that's um that's how I remotored my K37 after I rebuilt it and um, it it just runs amazingly well. I'll have to get some video at some point of this actually hooked to a DCC controller. The, the low speed limitation is really the fact that these motors will start rotating at such low voltages that it's actually um, kind of hard to get good conductivity between the locomotive and the track but if you're running DCC and it's you know 16 to 18 volts going through the track um, all the time that really helps a lot plus a lot of the uh, uh, controllers are using pulse width modulation anyway so that really helps with the low speed performance There was a little bit that I forgot to add there in that last segment, so I'm just going to go ahead and add this in. Um, if you can see just how easy these drivers move, I had mentioned before that I was using uh, Northwest Shortline lightweight springs. I put them in all of my locomotives, and it has a dramatic effect on how well these things will track and how well they run over rough track and also their pulling force. Um, they definitely maintain full contact with with all four sets of drivers when you uh, when you put lightweight springs in so I had talked previously about having to rebuild these drivers and the uh, drive gears here not being concentric so I did want to zoom in on this really quick so you can kind of get a look at one of these you end up having to pull the counterweight pull the journal pull a wheel um, pull a bearing and uh, which is in the gearbox here and then pull this gear off and underneath it like I said you're gonna find some really coarse knurling you just got to put these things in a jeweler's lathe make sure that you're using a collet or a good collet that's not been over torqued and is perfectly concentric and then just shave down the knurling until it's just a few thousands high it really doesn't have to be any more than that to be effective I don't know why they're so crazy with their overzealous knurling but do that and then um, you know, a lot of times I've got a uh, pot chuck that'll actually hold these gears without hurting them. And I can get them perfectly concentric, perfectly flat in there. And just very, very lightly clean up the bore uh, of the gear. And then when you push all this back together, there should be, there should be no hop. It shouldn't be running non-concentric. But... Um, I've found on almost every single one of these models that that's been required. It was a huge problem on the K37. There was a hop in this thing that I just could not get rid of. I thought it was a mechanism bind. I thought that something was hitting. And what I discovered was that um, when I tightened up the gearbox, the thing would actually lock up in one position every time. And when I loosened the gearbox, it would run just fine, which is what led me to tearing the axle apart. So, um, just a little piece of advice, if you're working on these and you encounter a similar problem, 
I can almost 100% guarantee you that this gear is not pressed on uh, concentric to the axle. Alright folks, well thanks for tuning in, and on that note, we're just going to go ahead and drive on out of here.